This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be taking you guys into deep space, deep scary space, the, the hell, the void. Uh, back in 1997 and that is Event Horizon and joining me today for the show of a very 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 special guest today it's been a long time coming it's uh, my boss from Legion podcast that's joining me it's Mr. Bo Ransell welcome to the show uh, hi uh, I'm excited to do this uh, and I always I bristle a little at boss because uh, mm. I'm a bit of a hippie yeah, <laughs> and and so and I'm also not writing checks to anybody, and I feel like that's when I become a boss. Uh, <laughs> I like here, and and this is no, I like, am not criticizing your introduction at all, but I I kind of go with editor in chief because that sounds a little more, uh, a, a a little more communal to me. Yes, okay, I'll, I'll, and, yeah, the chief, yeah, and, chief, yeah. yeah, and that that way it's uh it's it's less. Uh, you know, figurehead. It's more like, oh, I'm I'm just the jerk who's making sure that the website doesn't break, <laughs> um, which is kind of the reality of it. <laughs> it's just like, okay, is everything working today? <laughs> Ooh, good. <laughs> and, and keeping us all in check, all of us uh, fellow podcasters in line. <laughs> it, you know, it, it. I wish I could say that it was like a difficult. Uh, chore but mm. it's not because everybody like we've gotten legion to the point now where everybody that i work with on the network is somebody that i enjoy their shows i enjoy talking to them personally i enjoy being on their shows when i get an opportunity like this so um yeah it's it, it really is you know a, a genuine pleasure these days yeah, um, I, I totally agree with you because uh, as, as you know Bo, i was originally a listener He's become a podcaster, he's, he's joined the Legion gang, and it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this gang, and I've said this to Dan, I've said it to Ricky and Court and all our fellow other podcasters, and it's just a, it's just, just a lot of fun. So it, it's yeah, great, it, great it's a good here. group of people, mm, and yeah. uh, you know, I the the thing that I always want to sort of attract in in podcasters uh, and, and shows is uh, is just people who. You know, like take it with a a small degree of seriousness in terms of of you know the approach to do, doing podcasting, but uh, but beyond that, also I want the weirdest and goofiest people uh, yes. I can find as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, Ricky Morgan, perfect example of this. Yeah, um, who's yeah. a maniac? Absolutely, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm all, every time I speak to Ricky Morgan and I come off, I'm always jumping up in the air with joy. And yeah. my, my missus says, what's the matter with you? And I'm like, well, I've just spoken to Ricky Morgan. I feel like I need to run around a field now. Right. <laughs> Jump right. About, Why am I, you know? I, I need to take on a new project. I need, uh, I, I'm afraid uh, we've got to take the weekend to build the deck. I just talked to Ricky. Uh, he made me feel bad about how little I was doing with my life. And yeah. <laughs> now I'm a, I'm a bigger brother. Oh, dear. And, uh, and I like the way that there are these crossovers as well. You know, where there's, um, you know, someone will shout out somebody else on another show. I loved, I absolutely loved the garbage people stuff that happened a couple of years back between Court and Rick. I thought that was just insanely, uh, it it was genius really, wasn't it? It just sort of happened by accident, didn't it? And it's just great. Yeah, it it was really fun. Um, It's one of those things that I wish I had more time to kind of set up and organize. Mm. Um, But, you know, just by nature of my own schedule because in addition to you know the the website stuff uh i do a a couple of shows myself yes one of one of those requires a shit ton of editing right and and as a result i kind of like i i have as much as i can do right now and 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 sort of no more and i keep thinking to myself like i need to appoint a you're like vice president in charge of dumb shit around the network Mm mm-hmm you know, something like that of just like, I need you to just sit around and, and like once every two weeks come up with a, a dumb idea for, uh, for shows to kind of cross pollinate. Um, cause I really like that stuff, but I'm always like, when I look at my calendar, 
I'm always like four days ahead of where I need to be. Right, no okay. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, like there's a lot of video stuff that we want to do uh, uh, with with the network as well. And that's another thing where I'm like, I I wish I had more time to devote to some of that stuff. But also, I don't want to give up any of the other stuff I'm doing because I'm greedy and selfish. And um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, not to turn this into, into a, you know, here... Uh, the wish list of things that I, I wish we could do and I don't I need a clone is what I need I need another one of me to, to do all this shit oh I might uh, be uh, I might be caught sorts might be the guy to speak to about that or something or maybe Rick or <laughs> yeah, yeah like I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get a, a, a what is it, a Tulpa yeah uh, like Twin Peak style or uh, <laughs> well I, I was going to say another movie but bit of a spoiler and it's a recent movie so i'll keep my mouth shut well talking, um, i mean talking about clones i mean the one person i always thought that, was, that had been cloned has got to be duncan mcleish i've got to give that guy a shout out because i know you and duncan do a show together and i think to myself when it comes to producing shows what the hell i mean what's that guy doing up in scotland man i mean what's going on up there yeah it, <laughs> yeah I, I mean we need to send somebody to observe him Jeez. I don't, it's, it's really how does he do it it's really eerie hmm <laughs> uh you know like i we we had a joke and speaking of clones there was a yeah. joke in one of the westworld seasons we did about there being a robot duncan mm. and uh, <laughs> i i still believe that that is in fact the truth <laughs> and, and and according to the lore of the show if you're a duncan and Bocum correct listener according to the lore of the show the duncan that has been on the show since the westworld episodes is in fact the robot duncan Robot, uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'm pretty so, sure. Maybe I should do that for a Mystery Vault podcast one day. It'd just be Duncan McLeish, the man of mystery himself. Let's try and work that one out. And I'm sure, yeah. as you know, Bo, I, by the end of it, I'll be blaming aliens in some sort of way. <laughs> the man's been abducted yeah. and mass-produced. <laughs> right, he's one of them alien hybrid babies. <laughs> uh, doesn't need sleep. No. Nah. Just is trying to integrate into society, but is not as successful as he thinks. Oh, dear, man. <laughs> this oh, is all, all this crazy. theory is holding up. I think we can get to the bottom of it. Uh, but I agree. Total, totally a, uh, a job for the Mystery Vault podcast. Absolutely, yeah. I might have to put that down on there. But today, we are going to be talking about a film, which is a favourite of mine. Um, let's get into that. Should we go into Deep Space then, Bo, and talk about the old Event Horizon movie? Oh, absolutely. In space, uh, no one can hear you scream. Absolutely. Oh, wait. That, that's a different one. This is infinite, infinite Space, Infinite Terror is what this movie promises. And we will get into that. It's very close to that other movie you just um, mentioned there. But Okay, guys, let's uh, play with guys a trailer, and we will see you soon. This morning, TDRS picked up an automated navigation beacon broadcasting at two minute intervals in Neptune orbit. Neptune orbit. This is incredible. It's the event horizon. She's come back. The event horizon was the culmination of a secret government project to create a spacecraft capable of faster than light flight. The ship doesn't really go faster than light. What it does is it creates a dimensional gateway that allows it to jump instantaneously from one point of the universe to another light years away. Where has she been for the last seven years, Doctor? That's what we're here to find out. After seven years in deep space... There were 18 people on board this ship when it disappeared. I want them all accounted for. Opening outer door. It came back abandoned. Any crew? Negative. This place is a tomb. But it didn't come back alone. Captain Miller! I've got some problems here! This ship has been beyond the boundaries of our universe. Who knows where it's been and what it's brought back with it. Did you hear that? What is it? This ship is reacting to us and the reactions are getting stronger. What are you telling me? That this ship is alive? Oh. I have 
such one thing to show you. Oh my god. It knows my secrets. <laughs> Knows my fears. Vacate. I want off this ship. You can't leave. She won't let you. God help us. Okay, and welcome back, guys. Uh, so the synopsis to this film is a rescue crew investigates a spaceship that disappeared into a black hole and has now returned with someone or something new on board. It's a horror sci-fi thriller. It's got a 96-minute runtime. Uh, so Zack Snyder didn't didn't direct this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, two and a half hour zombie movie what are we even doing well you know what Bo I mean he, he could sort sort of learn a little bit of a lesson from films like this you know what I mean it's just I'd like a we, did, we didn't mention that but yeah two and a half hour zombie movie man I, I, yeah, I think that started with the Snyder cut yes you know? <laughs> did nobody have to ask for that one here it is yeah i must admit i do uh, that is one thing i do like about this film is i know there is um footage that has been taken away from it which is supposed to be quite gruesome as well um yeah, but, I but that was yeah, that was for mpaa reasons yes. of like hey man mm. we can't release this onto the public like this no and i i even think back in 1997 this is quite a good point. I think people might have struggled with that as well. Um, because I think now we're a little bit more acceptable to horror these days. And I think horror's really just sort of gone boom in a massive way. Um, yeah, it's taken more seriously for sure. Like you're seeing a lot more interesting directors dip their toe into genre movies than yeah. may maybe since the 70s is probably the last time. Exactly. You know, where you had like a William Friedkin and, you know, even Spielberg to, to some degree in the early 80s with Poltergeist of like, hey, you know, anybody who's anybody is making a scary movie. Yeah, that's it. And I, I think um, I think the thing with Event Horizon and actually Kurt, Kurt Russell was kicking around with a director on another set and he actually said to him, he said, this will be a film that people might not get now, but in 15 years time, people will get and it will be the film that you are glad that you directed and I, I, I'll i be happy if I directed this movie you know, well, even if I was in it I, I think it's a good film um, but like I say there was a point I was going to get to yeah so in the 80s you had um, all those horror movies that we love isn't it do you know what I mean all those top shelf ones that you thought ooh that looks good and then I think in the 90s um, horror just dipped a little bit of a lull and Event Horizon was kicking around, but I think if you had Event Horizon out now, I think it would be quite a successful movie. That's just my opinion on that. I don't know what you think about that, Bo. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Um, I, I did see this in the theaters. Yeah. Oh, uh, but... I, yeah, I think that probably a movie like this would just be more generally popular with an audience uh, or yeah. with a general audience. Um, but yeah, because I think most people like I, you know, I, I've told this story before, but when I went to see Midsummer, mm -hmm. uh, which was, you know, mind blowingly released wide into so many theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. Uh, which, I mean, I love the movie and all, but it's just one of those movies you don't expect to get a wide release like that. It mm, feels very art house. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, I ended up sitting like right next door to a couple that was there just out for a uh, a date night to a scary movie. Right. And then had Midsummer blasted into their eyeballs. <laughs> and and the girl was not okay at the end of that. She was She was upset. And uh, that was a date that did not end the way that gentleman wanted, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, um, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point being that if, a, if, if somebody like that, like I think they just got to Midsummer because they heard, hey, here's a scary movie. And I think, I think that's why 
something like Event Horizon would probably do better today. Mm -hmm. Just because people will go out, like we saw what happened with Conjuring 3. Conjuring 3, you know, d don't take my word for it. There are plenty of people that are like, eh, maybe this ain't the best Conjuring movie. But it's still doing gangbusters. Partly because people just want to get out of the fucking house at this point. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, you could release Event Horizon like the old event horizon uh next weekend yep. and it would still do a few million dollars mm. um but yeah but I, I i think as a result yes i think there's a general acceptance of horror and and sort of uh the the perspective on horror has changed where it's it's kind of shifted from being you know that kind of 90s uh you know slasher rip off kind of stuff that all that scream influence stuff um that that felt a little trashy and tawdry in the way that slashers can. And and I think that colored people's and there's the torture porn stuff, and that's not doing, you know, horror as a an entertainment any favors. Because when you say torture per porn, people aren't like, that sounds great with popcorn. <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 um exactly. but I, I think the shift in the way that horror itself is presented. Uh, as being something that is legitimate, you know, it's not just the the cheap movie that you're going to go see for uh, a scare. That they're they're actual good movies, and um, yeah. So I, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think Event Horizon um, would have been much more successful had it been released today. You know, uh, updating effects and et cetera, et cetera. But otherwise, kind of sight unseen. You could still put all of these same people in these same roles. And it would still be great. I think I agree with you on that as well. Because the other thing I like about this film is the cast. Cast is incredible. It's, um, I mean, th that's what elevates this movie. Mm. Like the movie itself, I, I have my problems with here and there. Yeah. But the cast is so damn good mm. that I just don't care. Everybody's going for it in this movie. Yeah, I mean, even with uh, one of my favorite actors is uh, actually Sean Pertwee from this side of the pond. He's got a very sort of dry sense of humour, but he he, he he does yeah. a great job in this, um, as he did in Dog Soldiers. Uh, he's pretty good in horror when he does horror. Um, also, Lawrence Fishburne. Now, I'll tell you about this. Uh, when I first went to go and see this film, uh, 1997, obviously we didn't really have social media. I think it was just maybe just kicking around, just starting off. Same with, um, you know, online, Google. I didn't know anything about this film at all. I was in the pub with a couple of my mates and we said should we go and watch a film yeah okay and we literally walked in and it was like there's my money let's go and watch this film and me being a, a fan from a young age of the sci-fi alien movies aliens I, I really enjoyed it and i just thought wow it's like someone's just kind of remade aliens or outland um and it kind of had that same sort of aesthetic um and then just going back to what I just said about this film not doing very well in the 90s, funny enough, I think it might have done well in the mid-80s if it was directed by someone like Peter... Is it Peter Hames, the guy who did Outland? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big Peter Hyams yeah. fan. Like, all his movies have that kind of Peter Hyams look to them that I really dig. So could you imagine if this came out in 1987, directed by Peter Hyams... And you kind of had that outland 2010 A Space Odyssey with someone like Roy Schneider. And then chuck in like yeah. this Hellraiser thing, man. I think that'd probably be the film that we'd probably all be talking about right now. <laughs> Spe all right, so I agree. Speaking of Roy Scheider, I watched Clute for the first time ever a few days ago. Right. Where he plays a pimp. Okay. Uh, and every and everybody thinks of Roy Scheider as Chief Brody, but mm. after seeing that role, I'm like, man, he would be so good in the Sam Neill role. Yes. Because he yeah. would be so welcoming up front of like, oh yeah, you know, I've just uh, I got a little bit of baggage, but I'm here to help the team, and oh my goodness, there's a spaceship. Yeah. And then that that turn uh, that the the Neil character takes um, into evil, I think he could play. Great. I, 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 again, after seeing Clute, I, it's one of those things where that movie is, of course, a classic. I had just never seen it. It's one of those like, oh my god, guys, have you seen The Godfather kind of things? Right. Where it's like, yes, of course it's a classic. It, it's brilliant. Everybody in it's brilliant. The fact that I'm just now catching up with it makes me feel uh, like the sun has shone on me or something. But I, yeah, I agree. I think, I think you could mine a really good 
80s cast out of this. Yeah. I think that you could probably get away with maybe a... I'd love to see nothing against Lawrence Fishburne, but I wouldn't mind seeing an 80s Harrison Ford in that captain yeah, role. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's the thing. If you take an 80s cast in there, someone like Harrison Ford would probably be quite good as well. But the thing I did like about Lawrence Fishburne in, the, in this movie... Now, having watched this from not knowing what the hell's going on, I actually thought he was going to be the villain because I, I thought that he had all this kind of... There was something about him. I just thought, is he going to be the bad guy in this movie? Because that's there is almost like a little bit of a twist from someone who hasn't seen this film. You see Sam Neill, and I'm immediate thinking, oh, he's Dr. Alan Grant from... Um, Jurassic Park, you know, he's got to be the nice guy in this, and he's a, you know, he's a scientist, and he's trying to find his ship. And then when I first watched this, I was like, oh my god, he's a bad guy, he's a villain, and he turns, and I, I, that to me was quite scary. And then all of a sudden, Lawrence Fishburne, who I thought was going to be the bad guy, comes kind of like the hero in the end, doesn't he? You know, he's running around trying to yeah. sort shit out. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I yeah, that. I mean, yeah. He, he's the dude who sacrifices himself so that others may live. Yeah, you know, he is. Yeah. He is absolutely the hero. And and for me, Lawrence Fishburne always brings a bit of class to yeah. every movie. Mm -hmm. He's just he's such a great presence, yeah. and and especially in a movie like this where his character is like. I'm the captain. Everybody be cool. Yep. Look, you know, we've got some problems in front of us, but mm -hmm. here's how we're going to deal with it. Everybody just chill the fuck out. Yep. And yep. then there's that moment where he, yeah, it's, it's where he leans against the ship. It's one of the things I, I really enjoy about this movie is this idea that just like touching the, the hull of this ship, oh, yeah. like opens this door to nightmares in your head. Um, and when he, I, like after the nightmare ends and he whispers to himself, God help us. And mm. there has been many a God help us in movies. Yeah. But Lawrence Fishburne is maybe in my top five of any character ever just being like, we're fucked. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> He's, he, he has like a genuine religious awe when he says it. It's really something. He, it's I can't convey it because I'm not nearly as good an actor as he is. No, but he, he does. He's got that conviction about him, isn't he? And I think what's clever here is the actual building block of the characters before anything shit has got, gone down. So you get what I like about this is you kind of get invested with all the characters here. I think it's a seven man crew, which is similar to Alien, which I noticed as well. Um, and a lot of the characters are very, very similar to the characters from Alien, which I don't know if that's been done on purpose because there was a little scene at the end between uh, Sean Pertwee Smith and, oh, what was it, uh, Kathleen Quillen Peters, and they're trying to get the rods, they're like power rods or something like that, and I just thought that was very, that's pretty much the same as Lambert and... Who is the other character now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Parker. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. I just looked um, at that because I, I watched it this morning. I thought, oh, my God, that is that is almost like a scene by scene. You know, it's very similar to what happens in Alien when they're trying to get away. And, they're, you know, and I thought, there's lots of Easter eggs in this movie from, you know, Aliens or um, Alien. But you know, I don't really have a problem with that. I just think it's it's nice to have that little Easter egg in this movie. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, yeah, kind of yeah. Well, you know, it, I mean, I think it's it's not hiding it, its uh, its inspirations. Mm. Um, you know, because it has that kind of uh, industrial feel to yeah. space travel. Uh, like you said, there there's an element of aliens in the the sense of like the colonial marines. Only in this case, it's a rescue crew. But it, but the the ship itself has that blend of kind of Giger esque like bio uh, in, industrial look, as especially the the drive itself, the the uh, gravity you drive. Know, that, yeah. Right, that that big spinning globe inside a room of spikes for no apparent reason, and it looks all gothic and mm. and like I said, there even the that that hallway, the curvature of it, kind of has a, a bit of the alien Giger design. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. And I, I, you know, that's not a complaint. I no. I'm all for like when when I watched this movie, and similar to you, it was it was kind of on a lark where it was me and a friend of mine named mm. Wendy. And we were doing the reverse where we both worked as bartenders at the time. Yeah. 
and were looking to, for a movie to see before we went to work. And we were just like, I don't know. How about Event Horizon? All yeah. right. Yeah. And so, and so we went to see it. And on the other side of it, both of us were like, that movie was genuinely unsettling. Mm. Like, I, we have to go work with the public now. And I kind of want to just sit down and think about things. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. That's already good. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Oh, but, but yeah. oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. no. This, this is, this. Oh, oh, the way we're talking about this film is generally, that's our reactions, isn't it? You know, we're both sort of like going, well, there's this, there's that. And... When I came away from it, I was the same as you. I, I really had to think about it. And I, 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 with all the films that you reviewed and I reviewed, and I had a lot of other guys say, about, say this as well on other shows, you know, if a film makes you do that after watching it, then I think that film has succeeded in some ways because you're, you're really thinking about it. Um, yeah. You know, you're, you're thinking, oh, what happens here? What happens there? You know, where did that come from? And how about this? And... Um, so I, I think the, the point I was getting to as well was, and this is very clever of Event Horizon, it's not a film that we haven't seen before, because <laughs> it chucks a lot of Easter eggs in there, but it's managed to be its own movie at the same time, which I think is very clever. So it, it kind of tells its own story with other elements from other movies. Um, and one of the other films I was going to chuck in there as well, which is very evident, and it took me a little while to actually see it, and it's right in front of you, is The Black Hole from 1978, 1979. Oh, sure. One of, one of the weirdest <laughs> Disney films ever. Yeah. I recommend it to everybody. I'm like, yeah. if you haven't seen The Black Hole, mm. it, it that is the era when Disney was like, hey, you guys just want to get a little weird. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and like that movie straight up ends in hell. And yeah. Yeah. it's it's wild, yeah. but yeah, you're right. It has that 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 very similar vibe of here is this ship that has appeared from nowhere, mm. and it shouldn't be here. It's been lost, and everybody assumed it was gone, but now all of a sudden it's here. Yeah, and and the fact that the only two movies of that type that I can think of are those two. It's it's Event Horizon and and the Black Hole. And one thing I always say about Event Horizon is why there aren't more haunted house in space movies. I don't know because it's such a great setting for this because you can't leave. It's the perfect excuse for why don't you just leave the haunted house you're in? Well, you can't. You're in fucking space. That's how you stay alive. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. So death yeah. for, waits for you outside. Absolutely. Uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, let's face it, a lot of us, we brought up Zack Snyder earlier. Um, I did enjoy parts of that um, movie that he made, The, the Army of the Dead, I must admit. Um, but well, I think a lot of people were saying, look, you know, guys, you know, the zombie genre has been flooded, which I agree with. You know, I mean, I, I think we could probably both, both agree being horror fans, we're both going to love the zombie genre. But oh, sure. you're, yeah, you're yeah. right, isn't there? You sort of think to yourself, why don't directors kind of just look a little bit of field and think, well, what hasn't been done for a while? And I think you're right, a haunted house movie in space. Let's have another Event Horizon-type-esque, alien-type movie, dirty space, something's going wrong. Uh, I think the only the only one we had, uh, I was going to say recently, but it's probably quite old now, is, uh, was it, I think it was called Pandora or something like that, the one with uh, Dennis Quaid? Oh, Pandorum, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, and, and that was... That was kind of similar, but it was more about the mystery of like where are they and what's going on with this ship and yeah. stuff like that. And I, I, it's been forever since I've seen it, but I remember mm. walking away from that feeling like they they had kind of squandered most of that opportunity. Yeah, um, yeah. but that's but, a, yeah. That's the only other one I I could really think of. There was a yeah. there was a little bit of a legacy with this game. I need to shout this out. There was actually a computer game called Dead Space, which came out, which was very yeah. similar. So, kind of well, yeah, that legacy. and that had all the gooey monsters as well. So, yeah. um, it, so here's the thing I think that Event Horizon does as well or better than almost any any piece of media I've ever seen. Yep, and and it's the notion of the personal hell yeah you know this idea because though you know largely the the premise of event horizon is that when they find this ship that's supposed to have you know gone through this hole in the universe and then returned uh only with no crew 
um, you know, the idea is like, hey, we're going to pilot this thing back and figure out what the hell happened to it and all that kind of thing. Only when they get on the ship, of course, uh, they start to be confronted with all of these personal demons they yeah. have. Like Lawrence Fishburne has this crew member that he he sort of watched burn to death mm-hmm. and had to make a command decision to let that man die in order to save others. And, uh, you know, a decision that has haunted him ever since. And Kathleen Quinlan has this thing with a sick child that that she's uh, concerned with and things like that. And so when the movie goes about the business of let's torture these people with what they're seeing, like, you know, Kathleen Quinlan in, in particular, that scene with her and the you know, child's body in, in the space hospital, uh, room. Um, I, I think is genuinely disturbing yeah, on a number absolutely. of levels, but like as it, just as a person, as like someone who can empathize with a parent in that situation, yes. it's just yeah. got awful. Mm. And, and I don't know that there's a, been a, a movie that I've seen kind of handle that notion, uh, better than this, even though plenty have tried and, you know, There's it's sort of like one. maybe The Shining is just one big version of that, oh, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, but you know, with little mini Shinings in this, where everybody has their own personal Shining. There was only one movie that I could see that had that relation between Miller and his haunted past was the original House movie. Um, yeah, where which I also adore. Yeah, got the he's got that Vietnam. Uh, PTSD, isn't he? Which they didn't bring up back then, but uh, he's obviously got his captain or whatever it is that he left behind that kind of haunts him. That's the only tie-in I saw there. But no, you're absolutely right. Um, and I think those hauntings could probably affect everybody. So, like you just said, you know, like you know, there's that parenting thing, isn't there? Uh, which I could relate to, and I thought, oh, yeah, that would be quite nasty, wouldn't it? Do you know what I mean? If there's like a vision of something like that. Um, so yeah, there's something that links in with everybody in this movie, um, and you don't necessarily see. And, and again, it's that haunted house thing. It's what's in the shadows, isn't it? You don't see a monster as per se. It's what that entity can do to you, isn't it? And um, I think this is where Sam Neill pulls this off incredibly well because he's he's a nice guy. He's turned evil, and he's still t- he's not talking abruptly to you he's kind of just speaking ah in hell in this place we don't need eyes you know and it's kind of that, that, that itself is even more like fucking scary yeah. than anything else isn't it <laughs> well it's yeah. like all of this his character is so much fun in this because mm. it's all about obsession it's you know he's obsessed with this wife that he lost and feels like he kind of sent off to die in mm. some way so yeah. you know he's largely a sympathetic character um, up until weird shit starts to happen, and and it's great Sam Neill, who by the way, national treasure Sam Neill, yes, uh, for yeah. his pictures uh, of his farm alone. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know all his ducks <laughs> yeah. named Kate Winslet and shit. I just love all of that. Yeah. Um, but he makes that turn in in the movie where his obsession leads him to sort of blindly want to preserve the event horizon because once he starts seeing his wife running around the ship, he's like, well, this is what I really came for. It's not really the ship. He doesn't care about that. He cares about his wife. And so when people are like, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to blow this fucking ship up because it's haunted as hell. And then we're going to get out of here. And that's where Sam Neill does that very like, okay, everybody, let's just think about this for a second. Look, we came all the way out here. Let's not do anything rash. Yeah. And and so by the time that he fully goes around the bend and and becomes a tool of the ship, yeah, uh, yeah it's like, okay, well, I totally understand how this character got here. You know, I understand what led him to this place. And like you said, his very reasonable approach mm. to chaos is really the, the one of the most frightening things about the movie is that he's just like, Hey, I'm doing you all a favor. You're, you need to come with me. You got to see this shit. Yes. And it's very, and, um, and I think that's where the Hellraiser thing comes in. And also the, I suppose you're all touching on a bit of HP Lovecraft there as well, aren't you? Because, um, I just reviewed The Void um, 
and looking at that it's funny when you when you do a podcast and you do a review you tend to look into it a little bit more and um I, having researched a bit of lovecraft i think what he was saying was you know humans need to let that go they're kind of doing themselves a dis, dis justice you need to let it go and then join the evil force or something i'm not saying i'm not selling that at all people but it's just when you watch these films it's almost like evil is just saying hey guys just come 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 to hell it's almost yeah. like he's saying it's not as bad as what you think it's going to be do you know what I mean and you know just let things go uh, which I've kind of noticed in the writings of Lovecraft with some of the movies which I've watched recently it's, um, yeah it, it's it's just it throws lots of interesting topics in there it really gets you thinking <laughs> Well, and, you know, maybe we ought to talk about the the mystery log that is sort of the, uh, you know, the, the mystery being oh, yeah. unraveled mm. is, of course, where the event horizon has been. Mm. And there is a log file of, hey, here's some video of the bridge and what happened at that point. Yeah. But it's terribly degraded, so we've got to piece it all back together. And... Uh, you know, as they're going through the movie, you get these little glimpses of like maybe some really ho horrible shit went down on the bridge. Like there's that great shot uh, when they first investigate, and there's lightning outside yeah. uh, because, of course, there is in a haunted house and space movie. And as you as the lightning strikes, you see that the bridge is kind of covered in blood, yeah, <laughs> and, oh, gotcha. and just gore and shit. And you're like, oh. Okay, well, that's what happened to the crew then. Yeah. Uh, and and so, uh, what it what is the the phrase? Hold on, we Liber we've got to get this right. Uh, Lib liberate, is it? Is it yeah. The, is it the um? Is it the liberate tutame? Something uh, like that. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, it, li liberate tutame ex inferis is the phrase, which is of course save yourself from hell we is what they translate. Which is, I haven't mentioned him yet either, uh, is Jason Isaacs. He does an uh, incredible job here when we're talking about casting as well. He's another building block. He's got a lot of conviction about him as well, isn't he? Um, I think he's a great addition to the crew or, you know, the cast in this movie. And the way he says that as well, doesn't he? He's always smoking a cigarette and he's kind of going, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, we, we, he's basically saying we're fucked, you know. There's yeah. something yeah. going on here which we, we can't really comprehend or understand. And um, this isn't going to go down too well. Right. Um, the the so. previous crew is telling us to get out of here. Mm, yeah. Uh, and, and so when they finally decode all this video and you see it, and this was a lot of the stuff that they had to trim out for the MPAA. But going back to what we were saying before, there's this sense of once you're exposed to, to this chaos realm that they go to that there is a perversion that happens there of of your moral sensibilities that you you like you're never the same you can't come back from it no and yeah. and so like that's why sam neil is like oh you don't have to have eyes there like it's it, you the the mere fact that you are existing in that realm leads you to you know fuck and tear and rend and bleed and yeah. all of that stuff it's it, you know those glimpses that you see of nothing but you know tearing flesh and barbed wire and sodomy and you're just like oh my god mm. this is uh, this is kind of what i imagine hell is not as i mean maybe the sodomy is a little fun but beyond that all the other stuff seems terrible yeah that's and, it um... it, <laughs> it's wonderful like i love that sense of like yeah but but once you get there it's you're gonna love it you know like you're gonna be so corrupted by this place that that's just what your life is gonna be forever after that which is again yeah. it goes back to the, the lovecraft thing of uh, from beyond which is kind of what they're trying to do in that or the the scientist in that isn't he? he's trying to sort of yeah get to the next level of this kind of like basically sex isn't it really he's trying to sort of get to that next sort of sexual sort of stimulation which then yeah. brings out the, the 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 old ones or the monsters and that's kind of what i got with this as you know and i think what's again what's happened here with this looking at this it's almost like a it's like a sort of jaws blueprint i know this kind of sounds strange but <laughs> hear me out it's like what you don't see 
you see more as an audience. So they've given you just a little glimpse of hell. And I think that's all you need because then your imagination fires up and then you go, oh my God, fucking hell. Do you know what I mean? So the actual cut cut footage, I quite like to see that footage. I don't think it does exist anymore. I think you'd probably see more of the, the hell and that little glimpse we saw there. But um, in some ways, the like I say, the less is more. Uh, and I think that works with this movie for that sort of Zack Snyder 90 minute <laughs> that we got. <laughs> Sorry, Zack. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. Oh man, not not since the swarm has a movie needed an editor more than uh, Army of the Dead. But yeah. um, yeah, I, I yeah, I think you're right. There there is a lot of implica- Like uh, you have that baby bear character. Oh yes, that but- <laughs> get gets uh, like a, just a touch of the event horizon infection and immediately tries to send himself out the airlock well, rather than live with what he's seen. I thought that was. Uh- and- Bon Jovi when I first watched it. <laughs> it's about the right time for yeah, him to be so, in yeah. movies, you oh, know, oh, Moonlight bon Valentino and Young Guns 2 and whatnot. Yeah, um, yeah it's, but yeah, I like, and again, I just love that notion of I can't live the way I did before knowing what I know now. It mm. is that Lovecraftian kind yeah. of vibe. I think with a lot of Lovecraft, the thing that hits me most with with him and the cosmic horror elements in Lovecraft is that these old gods just don't give a shit about people. No. And and if people happen to stumble across their nefarious schemes, uh, then you know those people are henceforth driven mad or or just die because of some incidental thing with the old gods, especially with uh, stuff like. Uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu in particular yes. as a piece yeah. is, you know, like the, the old gods don't give a shit about people. And and so I would say that the distinction between this and Lovecraft, although I do, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's tons of Lovecraft in this movie. I think the difference is that the old gods in this have turned their eye towards people yeah. and and are actually actively like, no, 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 come with us. They're like, they're recruiting, <laughs> you know, it's hell. We're hiring on the event horizon. And uh, as opposed to just, hey, you you know, if you stumble across it, then you'll go crazy. This, this is hell coming after you, especially by the end of the movie where, you know, Sam Neill is like, we're you and me and the rest of the crew. We're going to we're going uh, through the hole and and see what's on the other side for ourselves. Yeah. Um, and you all thank me for it later. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and I think the other thing here is, is like you say, you're absolutely right. And there is that mechanics, isn't it, of humans, or it's kind of it's that don't put your hand in the oven, or else you get your finger burnt. But still put your hand in the oven, or it's that sort of uh, they say, you know, be careful you reach for, be careful you venture for, and the human human race does that, and then they yeah. get into trouble and they do find hell. But then I suppose there is that other thing which is. I think John Carpenter does this along, and I think Darren Wilson nicely. Little shout out to Darren from Psychosomatic Podcast. Um, he he came on the show for uh, In the Mouth of Madness, and he said ninety percent of the time humans are in the shit <laughs> in these films. But he said ten percent of the time there's a chance that they just might make it. So it's almost like uh, that's the bit that you get at the end of this movie where the deck blows up and the ship goes back to Earth, and you know, little spoiler for this movie, but you know, some of our heroes make it with a little bit of a twist at the end, isn't there? But it's it's a good little format, isn't it? It's you know, it's going to go down, but there's a little bit of optimism there that we might just we might just get through this. So kind of works. Yeah, and you also close the loop on the Lawrence Fishburne character because once Sam Neill loses his shit, yeah, and start it, it starts getting uh, real demonic. Um, then yeah, then you know Lawrence Fishburne is like, "Fuck this, we're getting out of here. We're yeah. gonna blow this ship yeah. to hell, and we're <laughs> taking off." Uh, which is a great command decision. But then he realizes, like, "Oh, Sam Neill's never gonna let that happen. So I've got to destroy the ship with us in it to save the rest of the crew." Hmm. Which, like I said, it closes the loop on his character of being someone who watched someone die and and had to sacrifice someone else's life to save others now he you know this tortured soul is laying down his own life to save the his his crew 
and can kind of rest easy uh, in some ways, knowing that he saved them. And yeah, so there is uh, there is some hopefulness that you know this isn't entirely a grim movie, which uh, which I like. Like sometimes I'm in the mood for that, but most of the time, if there are characters I'm invested in, yeah, um, th- yeah like this movie, as you said, it does a nice job of of kind of setting all these characters up, and you kind of kind of know who they are. Um, I wish Fishburne had made it as opposed to say Cooper, who is mostly just annoying in this movie. <laughs> but yes, yeah. I mean, we haven't gone to him yet, but we will. <laughs> yeah, but other than that, um, I think it has a really satisfying ending. I think it it ends the right way. Um, I think it still leaves that like you could do a sequel to Event Horizon that is just hey, we picked up the work of you know Doctor Weir. And have created a new gravity drive, and we're going to test it here. And, you know, you have Jolie Richardson show back up and be like, fuck that, you guys are going to open hell. Like, you could do a whole sequel, and it would make perfect sense. But as a standalone movie, it works totally fine. I'm glad that they didn't do cheap knockoffs of it. Uh, But at the same time, I would love to see a reimagining of this movie. Um, if, you, if the right guy was attached, you I, know? I absolutely agree with you on that. I, I, I think a reimagining would be better than an actual sequel. I think if we did have a sequel, I think it probably wouldn't be as good. Um, and I think what kind of it just sort of leaves it to the to the imagination um, in the end. But yeah, that uh, Cooper character, he's <laughs> he does have one scene in it which does make me laugh because it's just like the comic relief. It's when the um, the was it the Lewis Clark blows up? Yeah, ship, the Lewis it? and Clark. Yeah, yeah, which I think is a great ship name. Those are yeah. very famous explorers. I was going to say, America. obviously, they've they, they explored most of America, didn't they, back in the eighteen hundreds? Um, yeah, cut across from the east coast to the west coast. That it was, was it. One, one of, yeah, it was actually a brilliant expedition. It's a fascinating story, which I love myself. All the adventure and stuff like that on a side note, but. Um, yeah, I, I like it when it blows up and Cooper gets go, goes into space and he's going, oh shit, oh shit, what is this what has happened to me? Hang on, hang on. He sort of purges his tank, doesn't he? He goes, here I come, motherfuckers. <laughs> it's like, oh great. Yeah. It's just a little bit of like, yeah. <laughs> there's a little bit the, of comedy relief. Yeah, I, I, I think the problem with that character is that he's always the, the kind of wise acre of the group. Yeah. I sound like my grandfather, wise acre. <laughs> no, um, but it, it doesn't leave that character much room to actually be a character other than the guy who's just quipping all the time. And some of those fall flat. And when you have a character that's relying entirely on being the comic relief of the movie or sort of in, in some cases, just the audience surrogate, that's like, what are you guys talking about? What the fuck is going on? Oh, you yeah. know, that kind of character. Oh, I mean, he, he is a character where nothing is phasing him. It's always, I mean, you got, you got, Sam Neill has been turned into pretty much a demon. All shit is going down. One of those astronauts has just gone out and he's, you know, almost blown himself up with the out of the airlock. But then he'll be coming out, won't he, with a little cup of coffee and a, you know, cigar, and he goes, "Hey guys, do you know the toilet's blocked down there?" <laughs> like that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's like. We've got a little bit more to worry about in that at the moment, do you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> yeah, I think it, it, it's it's one of the more uh, it, it's one of the downsides of the movie. I think mm. I think I don't think that character tonally is what you need in this movie, and and this is no fault of Richard T. Jones who plays oh, yeah. Cooper. I yeah. think I, he's doing all he can with with the role. I just don't think it, it's mm. in a movie that is largely well written and crafted and it's by far my favorite paul ws anderson movie yeah um i yeah i think he's a little off i wish there were a little more meat on the bone of the jolie richardson character yes uh because i think by the end of the movie when you end up you know again spoilers for this 20 ish year old movie but um yeah like they end up as the survivors and uh i kind of wish that like I understand that she's sort of the tough second in command, but I wish you knew a little bit more about her so that when she survives, I could feel a little bit more a sense of justification for that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I agree, yeah. But you know, those, uh, those are kind of my, my 
quibbles with the movie that and the, you know some of the effects are a little dodgy at this point um you know it was yeah. it was late 90s cgi that that stuff only holds up so well yeah that's that's unfortunate isn't it and that is that goes between like you know what we had in the 80s i mean us guys have mentioned it so many times and uh you know like with the practical special effects um that we had and they have they have they've done better than the films that come out in the 90s and they especially with films i love the movie uh the the mummy from 1999 i think is a lot a lot of fun but the cgi in that movie really lets it down and if you had a little bit of uh you know bit of rubber and prosthetics and all that sort of stuff i think it would work really well today um but yeah i, I, I do agree with you on that cgi so lets it yeah. down a bit it's yeah i mean it's hard to blame the movie for using the technology that was popular and available at the time but you're right like if, if movies this is a weird example but for example i think a movie like psycho goreman oh yeah is yeah. going to look just fine 20 years from now yeah. Yeah. because it's you know it's got a style it's all practical etc cetera, etc cetera. And it doesn't rely on effects that are subject to being dated, mm, you know, right. for the most part. And, uh, yeah, so I think that makes a little bit, and, and the practical stuff still works. Like the Sam Neill makeup is great when you oh, see, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the video from hell that was taken on the event horizon, <laughs> all that stuff is still like real, Oh yeah. uh, you know, like effective and kind of shocking and all that stuff. So there's plenty about Event Horizon that still works. But if you're seeing it for the first time, there it's also going to be uh, a little bit of a a bargain that you make with yourself of like, okay, I'm going to overlook the floating water bottle. And, <laughs> yes, I see. You know, the agree. book that looks like the opening of Amazing Stories. I'll ignore that, and uh, <laughs> it, it's fine. Yeah, why are you hiding behind the couch? Is it because it's a scary? No, it's because I'm just trying to avoid that CGI. <laughs> Once it's yeah, gone, I'll I, come back. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to fast forward <laughs> until they get gravity restored on the event horizon. Because yes. all that floaty <laughs> shit looks like garbage. But once once everything once they have gravity again, things are pretty much fine. Yeah, that's, that's the most terrifying bit of the movie. <laughs> And the, uh, yeah, that's why when I have to hide my eyes, the uh, the the shit design for both the Lewis and Clark and the Event Horizon, the Event Horizon in particular, mm. incredibly good ship design. Yeah, love it, absolutely uh, love it. Yeah, yeah. again, bar borrowed from that you know black hole uh, slash alien playbook of make it look industrial. Like don't don't make it look pretty. Make it look like a ship that would be functional. Yes. Yeah. And. But but uh, with the Event Horizon, you still have that like long neck design that reminds me a, a bit of 2001 as well that I really yeah, like, and yeah. it's it's super cool. The the Event Horizon looks awesome. If that ship were not haunted by hell, it would be great. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'm glad you brought up the 2001 or the 2010 one with Helen Mirren. Um, I've, I think that's another movie. I think I mentioned at the beginning of the show actually, but it's another film which I could bring to this. Obviously, that film's got more of a happier ending, isn't it? Because it's trying to... Yeah. But they're still trying to find something, aren't they? That entity. And it Something's going to happen. Mm. Something won. And yeah, well, no, yeah. I also a Peter Hyams joined. So he did uh, a great full job. circle on that as well. Mm. Uh, great John Lithgow performance in that movie. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of people forget he's in that movie. but um, Yeah. Yeah. And Roy Sider, holy shit. But weirdly... Uh, the movie 2010, the year we made contact, mm. the touchstone for our Event Horizon conversation. It has spaceships, it has Roy Scheider, it has Peter Hyams, mm. it has looking for something mysterious out yeah. in space. And I, I could, I know you said um, uh, Schneider could play the, the weird character. I could also see him play the Miller character, like the captain, because oh. he's got that conviction about him, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? You know, you could imagine. For sure. Him <laughs> have you looked out there lately because it ain't going too well out there do you know what i mean yeah, you can imagine yeah. schneider going like that can you <laughs> you know we need to sort this shit yeah. out <laughs> dr weir yeah. i think you need to come with me yeah that's it yeah uh, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's only space if you look at it from the outside. Uh, rip it off some Jaws lungs. Yeah, this is uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need a bigger ship. Yeah. Smile, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. When he's <laughs> the very short. Uh, you know, he has a fear of going out in, out in space. What do you call it, honey? Choking to death. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, he would be great. But yeah, mm. there's Event Horizon seems really unique still, mm. and that that's strange that a movie that is sort of has this kind of like cult following around it. I think it's a movie that has sort of low key become a movie that everyone sort of knows and talks about in the horror community as being sort of sort of special for all the reasons that that we've described here. Um, you know, it's not without its problems, but again, I just think it's so unique in the genre and there's just not a lot of movies like no. this and certainly not a lot of movies that are this successful at it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it would be like you just said, difficult to try and find another movie like this, uh, which kind of goes back to, you know, I think directors and producers and that should have a go at this, you know, get back to that sort of deep space haunted house movie. Um, I think it would work right now. I yeah, think you, I think you might just yeah. yourself a, like, yeah. get like Duncan Jones or somebody like that to do it. Yeah, you absolutely. know. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, especially these in in a post COVID world, um, I think you could emphasize the notions of isolation in space mm. and sort of address that. Uh, like, if you wanted to do something a little bit different with Event Horizon, I mean, still keep all the hell stuff, of course. But to uh, to sort of, you know, discuss this idea of like what happens to people when you isolate them on this on this trip, you know, uh, and maybe the the gag of going through the, the wormhole in Event Horizon is that, hey, maybe it's instantaneous to the outside viewer, but the journey through hell is hundreds of years or something. Oh, yeah, that would be scary, wouldn't it, actually? Yeah. Cause yeah. Like, because then all of a sudden you've got the psychological thing for the audience, and everything. because then they'll come out and think, oh, yeah, it was only just for a second, but it was, like I say, hundreds of years of hell to try to get through. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good concept, actually, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, visit. <laughs> Make that world. Go go and make that Event Horizon remake that I described, and I will totally I will totally watch that movie. So a couple of years down the line, Bo, there'll be a director out there on TV be interviewed, and then they'll say, "Well, where'd you get the idea from?" Well, I was listening to Bite Size Cinema, the uh, Duncan <laughs> Bo Ranzel and uh, R.J. McCready, and yeah, just gave me the concept. <laughs> yeah. They, they, yeah. But here's the exciting thing, because, you know, Event Horizon is now, you know, what, 24 years old? Oh, man, that's that crazy. Right? Yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that means there are there's a generation of directors that have grown up with Event Horizon. Mm. And I think sort of like you see with something like The Void is a good example of, like, these are people who clearly watch John Carpenter movies. Yeah. And I think you're going to have some director that grew up on Event Horizon and is having the same discussion of like, man, why don't they make movies like Event? You know what? I'm go I'm going to make an Event Horizon. Yeah. Um, I would not be shocked if over the next five to ten years you saw a movie that was either a remake or heavily inspired by Event Horizon. That it, we are about due for that director that got twisted by this movie at the age of nine to exercise that childhood trauma on screen. Yeah, absolutely. And like I say, fair play to, uh, was it Paul? Paul W.S. Paul Anderson. Paul W.S. Anderson, yeah, who has done a lot of movies that I feel ambivalent to terrible about. Mortal Kombat, uh, Soldier with Kurt Russell, Resident Evil, Alien vs. Predator, to name some of the few. So he's been a yeah, he's done a, yeah. done a bit. He, uh, he did all those Resident Evil movies, which mm. are largely unwatchable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he he clearly, uh, first of all, loves his wife Mia Jovovich, no mm. question about that. Yeah, um, he did a Three Musketeers with her at it, even. Uh, but yeah, I think this is his best movie as, as far as just being a a work of a not just competent director, but somebody who had a vision for the movie and so forth. Um, and I just think a lot of his work tends to be a little more journeyman. 
Uh, although I do have a lot of fondness for Mortal Kombat as well, and Soldier, quite frankly. I, I think Soldier is huh. an underrated film. Well, there it's, is... got, it's got Kurt Russell in it, isn't it? So, you know, it's, anything that he it, does is good. So oh, It's, it's got good. an unnecessary Led Zeppelin needle drop in that movie <laughs> that I adore. <laughs> it is, it's a quick sample. It's the, uh, when Jason Scott Lee shows up in the, the big fight at the end of the junkyard or whatever the hell it is. Uh, and there's a little bit of immigrant song that plays when his, you know, ship comes over the the edge of the hill or whatever. Been a while since I've seen it, so I probably yeah. I guess so. It's been a while bubbles. since I've seen it, but um, Jason Scott but Lee, I, yeah, I, yeah. But think? I remember that immigrant song "Needle Drop" and seeing that and being like, "Oh my god, did they just go Zeppelin in this movie?" <laughs> and him, it, like him teaching that kid how to kill a snake with a boot. You know, shit like that. That's weird shit. That more movies ought to have Kurt Russell teaching children to kill things with a boot. <laughs> well, there you go. Like, as, as I always say, if there's something you can remember from a film that it's obviously worked somewhere. Do you know what I mean? So that's always a that's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, it, yeah. And the whole thing was like, like the husband was kind of nebbishy in that movie and stuff. Or maybe the, hus- the husband was just gone. I can't remember if, if he was just straight up dead. Uh, like I said, been a long time since I've seen Soldier. What this conversation has taught me: one, I still like Event Horizon; two, I should watch Soldier again. Oh, well, there we go. That's where that's where we've led to. So watch Event Horizon, then double bill it with um, some Kurt Russell as Soldier. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, what are you going to do? I'm yeah. going to kill them all, sir. <laughs> that is the thing I will always remember from oh, Soldier: is the dude. I will kill them all, sir. I think um, that, that that is Kurt Russell having his uh, having his line in a movie, isn't it? He? he does it every time. Um, yeah, right. I mean, you've got Kurt Russell in your movie. Give him one line. He, the he, only way that can be better is if you add an asshole. I noticed. I'm gonna kill them all, asshole. I noticed with Kurt Russell, he has a line in every movie. Just for a shout out to him now. Now I think it was in uh, Stargate that came out around about this time. Um, Here's the best part of that movie for me when he's fighting that pharaoh and he's like, send my regards to King Tut. Boom! You know, you know, he just ad lit that <laughs> yeah. line, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, like Carpenter knew what the fuck to do with Kurt Russell, where he was like, give him every awesome line. Yeah, that's it. In, got, in the movie. Yeah. Like, you, you, Big Trouble in Little China is not a. a well, I was going to say it's not even a movie without Kurt Russell because that's not entirely true. It's just not a classic without Kurt Russell oh, no. because without him being the bumbling idiot thinking that he's the hero of the movie and being wrong about it it just it just doesn't work the same way <laughs> like again Carpenter was he looked at Kurt Russell and was like I know how to make you an action hero forever uh, let's look here's the script for Escape from New York you're gonna love it and from then on, as soon as you, as Kurt Russell said, "Call me Snake," oh, he was yeah. forever going to be a, an action guy. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, and it was good to see him. Whilst we're talking about Kurt Russell as well in horror with Bone and Tomahawk, which is a film I need to talk about on Bite Size as well. Uh, I thought he did a great job with that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that perfect combination of Kurt Russell in a western, and it's a horror movie. Mm. Uh, it's that's hard to resist, man. That's like that's tombstone with a lot more gore. Yeah, and what what is good to see as well is, is horror. The thing the thing I find with horror is there's I don't want to say there's a small group of people that like horror in the industry. I think it's broadening out a lot more now. But what's interesting is when you get someone who wouldn't do a horror movie, but when they do one it's good and the audience goes wow i never would have seen that so it'd be a bit like say putting tom hanks into a horror movie what the yeah. hell would, what, I, I think tony collette's a pretty good example yes uh, yeah like after seeing her show up in hereditary oh wow yeah. i mean i guess she was in six cents but mm. like when you see her in hereditary you're like holy shit it turns out if you put a really great actress in a horror movie it makes the horror movie like 15 times better. Yeah, it's it's funny how the, the dynamics and the chemistry just works, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, um, yeah, keep experimenting, guys out there, you know, with these actors. Yeah. Just chuck them in there. Someone you wouldn't think would be in a horror, just chuck them in and see what happens. And nine times out of ten, I think it'll probably work out. <laughs> 
I think that's <laughs> kind of the story of Event Horizon. That, like we said when we started this conversation, like the cast of this movie mm. gives each one of them is giving a good performance for the roles that they've been given. That's what you know. Cooper is not my favorite character, but all that all that said. You know, Lawrence Fishburne is killing it. Jolie Richardson's really good in it. Sean Pertwee's killing it in this movie. He's got a, that great death moment when he realizes, oh, shit, I found the bomb and oh, yeah. I don't have any time left. Yeah. And it's it's a great reaction. It Like, all that stuff is really effective and it's really good. And it elevates the rest of the movie because... You know, Sam Neill is so wonderful and creepy and evil by the end of this movie. All that stuff. Like, it, it, you know, when you have a cast that is this talented giving a shit about the material, it, you, it it's hard to make the movie terrible if that is happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as, as we're sort of, I think as we're coming to the close of this show, I think that is where we get into with Event Horizon, isn't it? I think if you've got a good cast in a movie, whether the movie works or not, generally as it gets older and it moves along, I think this movie will survive because of the cast alone. Do you know what I mean? It's just um, if you've got good characters and good actors and people invested in it, then that will make that movie work. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, that that you get a great cast and a handful of great horror moments, mm. which this movie also has, and and like you said, it it's going to stand the test of time. People will be talking about Event Horizon in another twenty years. Yeah, that's it. And and the other thing I was going to say is, even if someone's movie hasn't done very well at the time, just keep 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 faith for that movie because maybe one day it might just do you know well like you know yeah uh, well it's the, the career of david bowie i'm gonna make a thing and about 15 years from now people will understand it yes yeah, it. yes yeah, it's, it's a good way to explain it uh john john carbons is another one of those guys that probably agree with us on that <laughs> yeah yeah for sure like that's a dude who you know pretty much stopped making movies because he caught so much shit for the movies he was making mm. and and is now looked at as one of the greats of oh, yeah 70s and 80s cinema and uses all of that like newfound fame and fortune to do nothing but play destiny and and make music and i love all of that yeah and he's doing a great job with the music as well i went to go and see him a couple of years back uh he's having a great yeah. time he's having a great time yeah for everyone like i would of course love to see john carpenter like come back and make a movie that was really personal for him and something that he was passionate about but also, I would never be the guy to tell John Carpenter he ought to make a movie. Like, he's he's done his tour. He served his time and had one of the greatest runs of movies in cinema history in the late 70s and early 80s yeah. where he just couldn't make a bad movie. Yeah. And, um, and, and so if he wants to make music and play video games, fucking let the dude play music and, oh, and man. video games. Smoke a load of cigarettes and video games, like you say. But I think with John Carpenter, yeah. it's funny how <laughs> all lo all roads lead to John Carpenter and Kurt Russell. Look where <laughs> we've ended up, you know. We've we've yeah. uh, we've, we've gone. We've, so basically, we've gone onto the event horizon. We found the porthole to hell. We've opened it up and we found John Carpenter and Kurt Russell on the other side, yeah, just hanging out, <laughs> playing yeah. video games. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if if there were a television show of <laughs> Kurt Russell and John Carpenter just playing like Destiny and Borderlands and shit, it would be <laughs> my favorite show yes. ever. And just them kind of like laughing and occasionally telling stories and John Carpenter's lungs somehow still pumping despite all the tar and nicotine he's dumped into those things <laughs> over the years. Like, uh, yes. holy shit. And, like, uh. John... God damn, he is such a national treasure. I know mm. I, I I say that about a handful of people. One of them, of course, uh, uh, Sam Neill, uh, but yeah. also John Carpenter uh, and Kurt Russell, all treasures. We yeah. ought to we ought to just preserve them right now because they Probably are general, like, they all. are the everyday guy, aren't they? They 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 are sort of like say national heroes. Um, what you see is what you get, right? Maybe yeah, they guys. seem like genuine people. Mm -hmm. uh, Carpenter, in particular, has never given up that kind of punk rock no. philosophy of like, "Damn the man, I'm going to do what I want." Yeah, and 
and and managed to do that most of his career uh ha- had a bigger success with being like independent than almost any director i can think of yeah absolutely like i say we might just have one more hit and i think if we do i think john carpenter works well with a small budget full control of his movie and i'm sure there's a dusty old story on a shelf somewhere which you just pulled down and say hey guys i've got this one that's been kicking around since the 70s and it'll be like a film we've never even heard of or anything like that and he'll just go i'm gonna make it and uh yeah, yeah see what happens you know something just completely yeah, different it'll I think it'll be one of those things that like slips out where he's like, "Hey, everybody, I made this movie last month." Yeah, it will. It will. Yeah. I can't, yeah, I, we'll see. <laughs> it will, it will I, yeah. be like, "What? <laughs> wow!" <laughs> I, I'd love it. I'd love it. But yeah. you know, again, if he never makes another movie, he, I'm also of the mind that that guy deserves as much of a victory lap as he wants to take. He oh, doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't have to do another thing to be a master of the genre. No. Well. I think that's a good one to end on today, Bo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Look forward to our new uh, podcast that is just the Kurt cast where we talk about nothing but Kurt Russell. Uh, yeah. We're going to start with uh, Computer War Tennis Shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so today we're talking about Kurt Russell in Lost in Space. <laughs> right, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all space Kurt Russell movies there's gonna be Soldier yeah uh, that how much we wanted him in Event Horizon we'll talk about that oh, uh, no but this has been so much fun man uh, thank you so, uh, nah, it's you're been welcome, too yeah. long ah, it's good man it's good to have you on board that's uh, great um, do you just want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing next uh, sort of podcasting wise with your shows and that just before we uh, close the show Sure. Yeah. If, if you want to hear any more out of me, um, there's pick six movies, uh, which is a show I do with my buddy, Chad. Um, it is uh, a show I endlessly complain about doing the editing for, but I'm also endlessly proud of, uh, where we take uh, a theme. Um, for example, this season, we are doing a theme called it's like jaws where Chad and I are looking at a half dozen movies that are basically jaws ripoffs. And we've done, uh, Grizzly and uh, The Swarm um, and then we've got some more to come uh, like I said half dozen around that theme we're on season 16 of that which is crazy wow. so if you want uh, a podcast that has oh 90 ish episodes in the can there you go uh, then I do Duncan and Bo Come Correct which is me and Duncan McLeish uh, who we mentioned earlier um, looking at uh, various movies and television shows. Right now, we're doing kind of a recap podcast for the Canadian uh, horror series Slasher, which is endlessly stupid. And we've been having a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of silly voices and nonsense. And uh, then there's Hero Hero Go Show, which is a bi weekly show I do about Asian horror films, which uh, it aims to be a little bit more informative and you know kind of looks at those movies in a little bit of context uh both in terms of uh the directors and the the artists making the movies and also a little bit of cultural context uh which i i like i you know i was one of those people that when i first started watching especially a lot of j-horror uh i was like those movies are so weird Mm. uh how come and so I launched a podcast investigation of that subject. And it turns out that, you know, all the stuff that seems really foreign and strange and kind of wonderful about those movies l- is largely rooted in a culture that is thousands of years old. And uh, it's really fun to pick that stuff apart and not just uh, J horror, but we go all over uh, the, the continent with, you know, Indonesian stuff and, and Thai stuff and Korean stuff and uh, all that stuff. Uh, Hong Kong, especially. Oh my goodness. So much great Hong Kong cinema. Um, at any rate, uh, so do those. And then, uh, of course I kind of, uh, oversee the, the goings on at Legion uh, where you can hear this very show as well as a number of other things. And I would encourage, uh, all the listeners, um, to head over to our YouTube channel where you can see stuff that, uh, ain't a podcast, but we're, we're doing original stuff over there too. Oh, fantastic. Okay, thank you, Bo. Well, look, as, as, as we just said, you know, it, it's been great to have you on the show. Finally, <laughs> we finally got together. No doubt uh, we will do something together uh, again in the future. We'll pick a movie and we'll talk about it. And uh, 
end up talking about John Carl to Kurt Russell by the end of it, whatever movie that is. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. Yeah, we are, no matter what movie we do, we, we could do, like, Cruella, and it, it will turn into <laughs> yes. a discussion of Carpenter and, and Kurt Russell by the end of it. So uh, that that is... That's the bow promise. Oh, man. So there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed the show. Um, if you haven't seen Event Horizon, go check it out. It's a, it's a fun movie. It's a, it's a 90 minute fun sci fi horror movie. So go and check it out. But um, as always, guys, a little bit of um, admin for the show. As Bo just mentioned, I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. So go and please check out all the other shows on there, including my other show, which is the Mystery Vault Podcast. And you can find, uh, yeah, <laughs> blame the aliens, man. It's always the aliens, wherever mystery it is. Um, and you can find uh, Bite Size Cinema on iTunes, on YouTube, Spotify, several other players. Uh, if you put in Bite Size Cinema podcast into Google, it will find you somewhere or lead you somewhere to listen to the show. I've also got a Facebook page, um, so drop any comments on there or let me know if there's any films you want me to have a look at. I'll be happy to have a look for you. So um, the next show I'm going to be coming back with is the film Braveheart with Kung Fu Dave. We're doing our medieval stuff, so we'll be having a review of that movie. Um, so look out for that. So yeah, um, yeah, keep looking at the skies, guys, and be careful if you travel into deep space because you never know what you're going to find. So keep it bite size, keep it safe. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.